make. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with SilverDoctors.com and back with us today is Rob Kirby from KirbyAnalytics.com. Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure to be with you again, Elijah. All right. Well, I'd first like to discuss about the precious metal markets. Now, one of the things we recently saw and you've talked about is that on this last Thursday, 10,000 silver contracts were dumped on the market in one minute. Can you talk a little bit about this and how significant this is? Yeah, Elijah, I think it's extremely significant uh, uh, in terms of giving people, um, let's just say, a window into the nature of uh, something that I've talked about for many years, which is the manipulation of the precious metals and who uh, might be behind such manipulation. The 10,000 contracts in question were dumped into the uh, uh, into the marketplace at 7.15 p.m. Eastern Time, which is probably just about the most illiquid time in the 24-hour trading cycle for silver. 7.15 is a time when Asia is not really quite open yet or, or people are just arriving to work. Um, and uh, the London, the London people, you know, they aren't they aren't anywhere close to being in. And the North American traders have, for all intent and purpose, gone home, which means that the markets are extremely thin at that hour. And let's just think in terms of what 10,000 contracts of silver really is. Each contract is supposedly uh, 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 represents 5,000 ounces of silver. And so a 10,000 contract order would amount to 50 million ounces uh, of underlying uh, silver that was being sold. And, and, and these 10,000 contracts, like I said, or, and you mentioned, they, they were pushed into the market uh, in, in literally in one minute. And it was a market order, which means, uh, uh, you know, there was no, there was no uh, restriction given as to the price. Well, when these things were offered for sale, they were sold at the market, which means bids kept getting hit until the 10,000 uh, contracts were liquidated. So uh, what, this, what this did to the marketplace is it, is it dropped the price of silver from uh, just, just over $16, it dropped it down to $14.23 in, in, in the space of a minute. And what happens when that occurs is there are people who leave orders with brokers. For instance, people who are long silver contracts uh, um, who want to uh, uh, have, have supposedly downside protection to their long position, they leave an order with their broker that if a price threshold is achieved on the downside, uh, their long immediately gets liquidated at the next price. So, and 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 this 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 is called uh, people putting in stop loss orders. And what happens when you have a a flush of of this many contracts? It triggers uh, and the price drops precipitously in, in a very short time. These stop loss orders get triggered, and it makes people who are long and bullish of silver uh, be forced into uh, a liquidation of their position, which which further uh, uh, and you know uh, yeah. increases the, the downside uh, pressure, um, you know, in, in the underlying contract. So. Uh, the selling of these contracts in su such a short period of time. Uh, a, number one, guarantees that the seller is going to get a, a far, far, far less price uh, uh, for, their, for their product or their futures than uh, they would otherwise get if they had sold them at a time when the market was uh, not so thin. So the question really should be for most people, why would somebody sell uh, – you know, $350 million worth of futures, which is roughly what uh, a 10,000 contracts uh, is, or, or whatever it is, the, the 10,000 contracts, that would be 50 million times uh, 16. Um, 
which was roughly where the price of silver was at the time. So that, what's that around? Uh, actually, that's what is it? It's a, I mean, it's a big number. It's in the hundreds. It's hundreds and hundreds of millions. But who who sells hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of stuff uh, uh, to try and get the the least amount they can get uh, in return for selling it and taking the risk? And that's that's what leads us to uh, ask the questions: Who in the world, uh, like like hedge funds, don't operate that way? Hedge funds are always trying to maximize the return of, on their on their trades. Um, this clearly was not uh, the, the, this ten thousand contract sell was clearly not somebody trying to maximize their profit. Uh, the, this this was being done for for effect and basically to try and crash the market. And uh, you have to ask yourself who in the world would have the resources. To uh, you know, and, and the firepower uh, to execute such a trade, and 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 even above and beyond that, there there is in this world things called commodities trading law, and commodities trading law uh, uh, dictates that um, if 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 an actor is trying to uh, conduct trade. In, in a commodities market that would appear to uh, uh, be manipulative or, or uh, let's just say, outside of normal protocols, uh, the exchange can actually put the kibosh on, on this kind of activity at their discretion because, you know, that's what regulators at exchanges do. And, and we know for a fact that there was no, there was no, uh, in, in, you know, uh, interdiction by by regulators or the exchange to halt this kind of trade because it actually happened, and the price plunge did happen, and that would that would tend to tend to tell you that the the perpetrator of such uh, uh, such an act was friendly with regulators. So like it's it's really starting to smell like this trade was conducted. Uh, by or on behalf of uh, uh, official, let's just say government, a government actor, or a central bank, because you you would have to believe that anybody else who would who would attempt to to perpetrate such a trade would likely be stopped in their tracks and not allowed to proceed, or would would likely uh, be would would have faced uh, public. Um, uh, you know, scrutiny and and, uh, and condemnation uh, in short order, but this this is the whole nature uh, uh, as to why people in the uh, precious metals community or the gold bug community, this this is why they point to uh, manipulation as being the reason why precious metals are stuck in the rut that they're in. And the the evidence, in my view, is extremely overwhelming, and and frankly, anybody anybody who who can't see the mani manipulation that's occurring in metals on a regular basis, uh, you either have an IQ the size of your shoes, or, or you know, or you or you you know, or you're you're, you're willfully you're, or you're part of it, you know, and, and regulators. By their by their tacit approval of this, in in my mind, are part of the problem, and are part of the manipulation. It's regulators, it it is government, and it, with, with central banks acting as, uh, I believe, uh, the Federal Reserve acts as a broker, and I believe that the 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 chief intervener in the precious metals is uh, the U.S. Treasury's Exchange Stabilization Fund. And you know, I've been I've been on this topic for a long, long, long time. The evidence to me uh, is absolutely and utterly overwhelming. And anybody who denies that the uh, uh, intervention is occurring and and it's surreptitious and it's nefarious and it's and it's market rigging is is part of the problem and is and is willfully deceiving. Whoever listens to them, if anyone's listening to them, uh, issue utterances that this is anything but 
uh, rank price suppression, and it's being conducted at the very, very highest levels. And anybody who says that uh, anybody who says that uh, it's not uh, American centric, the suppression of these uh, precious metals, I would only remind them that the the it's you know the rigging of precious metals makes the dollar look good. And using the old uh, uh, cliche of key bono, who benefits? Uh, the benefactor of price suppression in precious metals is is the American dollar, and it's and it's all American centric. So, and, and to think that the suppression isn't being conducted by or orchestrated by American interests is is a dog that doesn't hunt. So I, I, I throw that out there for openers. And I hope I made my case clearly. So you think these 50 million ounces of silver that were just dumped on the market, that could have been the work of the U.S. government? Uh, ultimately, ultimately behind it, I believe it's the Exchange Stabilization Fund who has ferreted the orders through their broker, who is the Federal Reserve, specifically the New York Fed trading desk, acts as the sole and exclusive broker to the exchange stabilization fund and then the fed ferrets the orders to uh, uh, their web of captive central bank uh, uh, sorry commercial banks uh, which would be you know for, for the fed typically it's one of the five of uh, Citibank, jp morgan bank of america morgan stanley or goldman sachs because these are the five american institutions that all have derivatives books, you know, numbering from the low to mid forty trillion dollar mark to over fifty trillion dollar notional book size, and uh, these 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 metals contracts that we refer to or metals futures contracts that we refer to as paper metal, uh, these are all derivatives because the, you see. Let, let's just put it this way, Elijah. Nowhere, nowhere in the world is there 50 million ounces of physical silver for sale? Nowhere. You cannot buy 50 million ounces of physical silver anywhere in the world right now. So this is silver, the silver that was sold is silver that doesn't exist. And this, th this makes people ask the question, uh, you know, why, why is it that people are allowed to sell something that does not exist uh, to to dictate the price of something that is strategic and in short supply and very finite, you know, and there really isn't a good answer for it. And, and, and especially especially when you see the trade conducted in this fashion, in such a reckless fashion, it's it's it, it's very telling and it and it's very, uh, you know, it's very transparent what's going on. This this is this is uh, this is an act by officialdom to try and crash the price of, of metal, quite quite possibly and very likely to create an avalanche of selling, so that the commercial banks who are known to be serial shorters and serial serially short of futures contracts of metal. Uh, very likely to create a selling avalanche where they can possibly get their shorts covered because you know the world is is short of precious metal because it is finite and because uh, uh, it's uh, it's its popularity and desirability in physical form continues to grow especially in countries that have too many dollars and these would be the countries that have have foreign reserve accounts that are stuffed full of American dollars, and and in in, a, in an effort to uh, uh, reduce their uh, concentration of foreign reserves all in American dollars, because America continues to print and issue too much debt, countries are looking for alternatives to the U.S. dollar to so that they can. Uh, um, so that they can, you know, spread the risk around in their foreign exchange portfolios. They don't want to be holding just dollars, especially when the country issuing dollars uh, is spending like a drunk sailor 
and doesn't seem to have any uh, show any uh, interest in getting its uh, chronic deficit spending programs under control. So, you know, this, this is what's been happening. The traditional financiers of America, which are uh, traditionally they've been China, Japan, and Saudi Arabia, over the last two or three years, they've been lightening up of the amount of U.S. government securities they have uh, in their possession. And they've been showing waning interest in buying new U.S. government debt, which they continue to add to the debt pile somewhere in the tune of around a trillion dollars a year. And uh, this is what's given rise to the uh, foreign demand for physical metals. China, Russia, uh, uh, and other Asian countries have voracious appetites for physical metal not the paper contracts that were dumped into the marketplace last Thursday night in the silver market. And this, this has also given rise to and is, is, is a big part of the reason why cryptocurrencies have also taken off, because these stand as another alternative to the dollar and, and quite possibly might be instruments whose time has come. And we've seen the growth in the cryptocurrencies in the last four or five months grow dramatically. At the end of February, the whole crypto space had a market capitalization of, let's just say, probably 10 to $12 billion. Today, the market capitalization of the crypto space is over $100 billion. So the market cap of the crypto space has grown roughly tenfold in the last four to five months. And people may scoff at the notion that there's a hundred billion dollars worth of cryptocurrencies in the marketplace right now and say that that isn't a significant amount. Well, let's see if they think it's a significant amount if it grows another, it grows by another factor of 10 in the next five or six months and maybe, maybe by Christmas or early uh, in 2018, maybe we're looking at a crypto market space cap of a trillion or more. And I wonder if people uh, will think if we get to a trillion or a trillion, over a trillion in market cap, whether that's a big number. You see, the, the, the whole issue of, uh, you know, how much is a lot is, 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 only, is only governed by effectively by how much debt there is in, in, in the world. And the amount of debt keeps spiraling up in a geometric fashion, which means that alternatives very likely continue to do the same. And I would, I would have it and would add that what we are seeing in the crypto space is exactly what fundamentally should be occurring in, in the precious metals space right now, and the difference between the cryptos and the precious metals is that the cryptos, you cannot sell a cryptocurrency unless you own the cryptocurrency. There is no futures market for cryptocurrencies. You cannot go short a cryptocurrency. But because we have commodities law that is not enforced by regulators, we have precious metals markets where players are allowed to sell specifically uh, and fundamentally, if they are players that are uh, representing officialdom, they are allowed to sell infinite amounts of uh, paper contracts uh, uh, representing uh, physical precious metal because regulators do not enforce commodities law and they turn, turn their heads the other way when, when uh, state players, namely the Exchange Stabilization Fund, goes into the marketplace and sells infinite amounts of precious metal, metal that has never been mined and very likely never will be mined. So that's the fundamental difference between the two. And that's why metals have been behaving so poorly in terms of price action while the cryptocurrencies have taken off uh, like a scalded cat. Now you've talked about how basically what the U.S. government is doing with you know price manipulation of precious metals. You've compared that to basically what the Enabling Act did in Germany under Hitler. Yes, I mean, look, 
the 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 uh, Gold Reserve Act in 1934 in America created the Exchange Stabilization Fund, and 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 seeded it, of course, with with monies that were uh, created when when the U.S. government uh, confiscated gold from American citizenry at twenty-two dollars an ounce, and then six months later. Uh, Re, you know, reset the, the price of gold up to $35. And that created a windfall of 2 to $3 billion. That was used as the seed money when, when the ESF was created. And that, in 1934, made the ESF the most powerful financial entity on the planet full stop. Well, in 1933, uh, in Germany, the Reichstag passed the Enabling Act. And, and what the Enabling Act did in 1933 is it, is it, gave, it gave Hitler what was called plenary powers. And, and plenary powers basically means he had the right to rule as a dictator and pass any law that he saw fit. You see, and what this leads to, when, when you put this much power into an unaccountable entity, and the uh, Exchange Stabilization Fund is an unaccountable entity. It does not report to Congress. It is not subject to congressional or Senate oversight at all. The Enabling Act made, made Hitler a dictator, meaning that he didn't have to uh, have any law that he wanted to bring in. Uh, uh, he didn't have to have it voted on by the Reichstag at all. And this made him the dictator. And this, this allowed him, Elijah, to pass laws that made all of his actions technic technically legal. So, you know, and, and isn't it funny, at the conclusion of the Second World War, when, 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 when Hitler and his henchmen were, were all facing uh, uh, the judicial process in Nuremberg, they just said they were doing their job and they were doing things that were legal. But the people in Nuremberg and the rest of the world didn't see it that way. And, you know, frankly, I look at what the Exchange Stabilization Fund is doing today, and I look at what the rest of the world is doing in terms of galvanizing against what is occurring. We, you know, because understand that the, 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 the big hammer uh, for the Exchange Stabilization Fund is the dollar, and to perpetuate the dollar as the world's reserve currency. Well, it seems to me that the rest of the world is quite fed up with this, because this is why we are seeing the likes of Japan and Europe doing trade deals, Russia and China, uh, Japan and China, Iran, Russia and China. They are all creating bilateral and trilateral trade pacts where the dollar is excluded from trade in the settlement of, 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 this, of the trade that they're doing. This... This is, this is metaphorically the equivalent of the Nuremberg judges saying uh, uh, what you, you know, you're saying that what you did was legal and you were following orders. Well, you know what, you're going to hang for that. Well, the rest of the world is hanging the dollar out to dry because they are sick of the way that the dollar is being shoved down their throats where American interests and American-centric interests are setting prices for everything strategic in the world at prices not favorable to the people that actually produce it. It's called stealing. And, you know, the, the, the extent to which the, do uh, the dollar is being rejected around the world uh, by America's neighbors, it's all because America has slipped into a, a I don't know, it, it, it's, a, it's a sickness where they, where they feel that the dishonest money that they're creating out of thin air uh, will be foisted upon the planet uh, indefinitely, and, and the rest of the world is, is, is sitting up and saying, no mas, we're not going to do this indefinitely. You see, and dishonest commerce, let it be said, Dishonest commerce, it even, it even talks about this in the Bible. Dishonest commerce is no foundation for good relationships around the world and internationally. And all you have to do, Elijah, take a good look around you. And what do we see in the world? The world's in turmoil. 
And international relations, I would say, are probably at a low point that, that I've ever experienced in my life. I'm 57 years old. And I mean, uh, to me, it's all traceable back to the notion that we have dishonest commerce, dishonest weights and measures, no foundation to build good international relations. The world needs a return to something that has integrity, something that has some transparency, and we have to get away from this bully thy neighbor attitude where I will tell you what the value of what you produce is uh, unilaterally, and you will like it. This, this is no way forward if the world is to be a peaceable place uh, on a go-forward basis. Now, how does this get solved in your view? The way this gets solved is when somebody steps up to the plate and demands delivery of physical metal which cannot be met, and this exposes the paper price rigging for what it really is, and we see the fall of the paper markets because they've been sufficiently discredited, and 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 this this this, in all practical terms, will likely take the form of. Uh, one of these major exchanges, whether whether it's the COMEX or whether it's the LBMA, who literally has to make a public pronouncement or declare force majeure and say that, uh, yeah, we, we have been overwhelmed and that they're going to have to admit that they've been overwhelmed by orders for physical metal. They cannot meet them and they are going to settle people in fiat money, which means they will arbitrarily uh, and, and they have the power to do this, but but it, but it, but when they when they do it, it completely discredits their exchange and what they stand for, and it also discredits all kinds of other paper exchanges because once once one of them once one pile of paper burns, all the paper burns. So we and 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 the process of this happening, it's called either a default or a reset. And at some point, this has to happen, because at some point, the amount of dollars and the amount of demand for physical metal will outstrip the price manipulator's ability to supply the real thing. It will happen. I can't tell you the day it's going to happen, but uh, mathematics and physics dictate it will happen. And my gut tells me we're likely reasonably close to this occurring. In fact, I think it could happen literally any time. And I think it's been close to happening before. And in the past, what officialdom has done to create it from going over the edge is they've created new instruments like GLD and SLV, which they claim are 100% backed by physical metal, but I doubt they really are. Uh, or, or let's just say, particularly, I highly doubt that they are not backed by unencumbered uh, physical metal, because a great trick of, of the central banking world uh, and treasuries around the world is to double count gold. And when I say double count gold, uh, for instance, America will, will, will tell everybody that they have 8,000 plus metric tons of gold in their sovereign reserve. Yet, America also has pledged gold to the IMF, and the IMF counts the gold on their balance sheet as if it's not encumbered. But let's just say the, the American gold that's been pledged to the IMF is part of the 8,000 metric tons that America holds. But the IMF claims to hold, I don't know, I think it's a couple thousand metric tons themselves. Well, some of that's the American gold that they say that they have. And some of the IMF gold is part of Italian gold that they claim to have. And some of that gold is part of, you know, the gold that Britain claims to have and that France claims to have. So there's, there's, there's double counting on that level. And then there's also double counting with regard to leased metal. Because when metal gets leased by sovereigns, the metal leaves the vault, it gets sold into the open market, and, and, and the leasing nation takes the IOU 
for the metal that left the vault, and they, in place of the metal that left, they put the IOU and they count it on the same line for accounting purposes as the gold that still isn't in the vault. So you see, this way gold gets counted more than once, and and it's it's basically a game of uh, I call it cup and balls. If you've ever seen the the cheap parlor trick done by magicians, where they'll have uh, three balls under cups and they move them around, and 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 then at the at the end of the day they they, they tip all three cups over and there are lemons under the cups, and it's all done by sleight of hand. Well. The, the the accounting that central banks use as a custom uh, is is basically a cup and ball routine as it relates to gold. Gold is double counted. Gold is shifted from one account to the next, and 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 you know at the end of the day, the, the amount of transparency that there is in in you know it, it's non-existent. And this, and this also speaks to, as to why there has been no credible audit of the U.S. gold reserve since 1958. That is, in my view, a glaring admission that, you know, the accounting that's done on a national level with regards to gold is so shoddy, uh, it, can't, it can't survive an audit. And, and of course, the... the, the, the the, the people that represent and, and the people that shill for these institutions tell us that there's been an audit. They tell us they tell us the Treasury does an audit every year. Let's just say that if 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 I if I was subject to an audit and and I uh, uh, tried to tell the tax man that you know I, I'm I'm on good standing, take it from me, uh, everything's in good order, uh, uh, I would be laughed at. So there has been no credible audit. We're not going to see a credible audit either, as long as the status quo is maintained, because it's highly, highly dubious that any nation actually possesses the physical metal that they claim to have, uh, with exception, very likely, to China and Russia, who, who uh, let's just say, serially underreport the amount of metal they have. And they have the reasons for doing that. Just as the West have has reasons for for saying that their gold stocks, uh, you know, are are much higher than they very likely are. So it's a game that's played, and and when the game ends, it's like musical chairs, and there there there's a great many people uh, uh, listening to the music play, Elijah. And when the music stops, there won't be very many chairs for those who who lunge for them. That's what will occur in the physical precious metals market. It's been a big song and dance for a long time. And when the music stops and people feel or realize or understand that they have to have physical precious metal to, to uh, have financial sustenance, when the music stops, there won't be physical metal for sale and people will not get it. Well, Rob Kirby, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and where they can find you online? Uh, you can find me online at kirbyanalytics.com. And, you know, uh, as, as, as dreadful as the price action has been in, in the precious metal space over the last while, I still maintain that you have to own physical precious metal and you probably want to own some uh, some degree of, of storable, uh, uh, you know, non, uh, non perishable food, uh, you know, and uh, you know, and you probably want to get your spiritual house in as good as order as you possibly can. Once again, Rob Kirby, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insights. It's been my pleasure. Make. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with SilverDoctors.com and back with us today is Rob Kirby from KirbyAnalytics.com. Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure to be with you again, Elijah. All right. Well, I'd first like to discuss about the precious metal markets. Now, one of the things we recently saw and you've talked about is that on this last Thursday, 10,000 silver contracts were dumped on the market in one minute. Can you talk a little bit about this and how significant this is? Yeah, Elijah, I think it's extremely significant uh, 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 in terms of giving people 
um, let's just say, a window into the nature of uh, something that I've talked about for many years, which is the manipulation of the precious metals and who uh, might be behind such manipulation. The 10,000 contracts in question were dumped into the uh, uh, into the marketplace at 7.15 p.m. Eastern Time, which is probably just about the most illiquid time in the 24-hour trading cycle for silver. 7.15 is a time when Asia is not really quite open yet or, or people are just arriving to work. Um, and uh, the London, the London people, you know, uh, they aren't they aren't anywhere close to being in. And the North American traders have, for all intent and purpose, gone home, which means that the markets are extremely thin at that hour. And let's just think in terms of what ten thousand contracts of silver really is. Each contract is supposedly uh, uh, um, re represents five thousand ounces of silver. And so a 10,000 contract order would amount to 50 million ounces uh, of underlying uh, silver that was being sold. And, and, and these 10,000 contracts, like I said, or, and you mentioned, they, they were pushed into the market uh, in, in anybody who, who can't see the mani manipulation that's occurring in metals on a regular basis. Uh, you either have an IQ the size of your shoes, or, or you know, or you, or you, you know, or you're, you're, you're willfully, you're, or you're part of it, you know. And, and regulators, by their, by their tacit approval of this, in in my mind, are part of the problem, and are part of the manipulation. It's regulators, it it is government, and it, with, with central banks acting as uh, I believe uh, the Federal Reserve acts as a broker, and I believe that the the, the chief intervener in the precious metals is uh, the U.S. Treasury's Exchange Stabilization Fund. And you know, I've been I've been on this topic for a long, long, long time. The evidence to me uh, is absolutely and utterly overwhelming. And anybody who denies that the uh, uh, intervention is occurring, and and it's surreptitious, and it's nefarious, and it's and it's market rigging, is is part of the problem, and is and is willfully deceiving whoever listens to them, if anyone's listening to them, uh, issue utterances that this is anything but uh, rank price suppression, and it's being conducted at the very very highest levels, and anybody who says that. Uh, anybody who says that uh, it's not uh, American-centric, the suppression of these uh, precious metals, I would only remind them that the the it's you know the rigging of precious metals makes the dollar look good, and using the old uh, uh, cliche of key bono, who benefits? Uh, the benefactor of price suppression and precious metals. Is is the American dollar to get a a far far less price uh, uh, for their for their product or their futures than uh, they would otherwise get if they had sold them at a time when the market was uh, not so thin. So the question really should be for most people: Why would somebody sell? Uh, you know, $350 million worth of futures, which is roughly what uh, a 10,000 contracts uh, is, or, or whatever it is, that the, the 10,000 contracts, that would be 50 million times uh, 16, um, so, which was roughly where the price of silver was at the time. So that, what's that around? Uh, actually, that's, what is it? It's a, I mean, it's a big number. It's in the hundreds, it's hundreds and hundreds of millions. But who, who sells hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of stuff uh, uh, to try and get the, the least amount they can get uh, in return for selling it and taking the risk? And that's, that's what leads us to uh, ask the questions, who in the world, uh, like, like hedge funds don't operate that way. Hedge funds are always trying to maximize the return of, on their on their trades. 
Um, this clearly was not, uh, the, the, this 10,000 contract sell was clearly not somebody trying to maximize their profit. Uh, th this, this was being done for, for effect and basically to try and crash the market. And uh, you have to ask yourself who in the world would have the resources to, uh, you know, and, and the firepower um, to execute such a trade. And, and, and even above and beyond that, there, there is in this world things called commodities trading law. And commodities trading law uh, uh, dictates that um, if, if, if an actor is trying to uh, conduct trade in, in a commodities market, that would appear to uh, be manipulative or, or uh, let's just say, outside of normal protocols, uh, the exchange can actually put the kibosh on, on this kind of activity at their discretion because, you know, that's what regulators at exchanges do. And, and we know for a fact that there was no, there was no uh, inter, inter, you know, uh, interdiction by, by regulators or the exchange to halt this kind of trade because it actually happened and the price plunge did happen. And that would, that would tend, to, tend to tell you that the, the perpetrator of such, uh, uh, such an act was friendly with regulators. So like, it's, it's really starting to smell like this trade was conducted uh, by or on behalf of uh, uh, official, let's just say government, a government actor or a central bank, because you, you would have to believe that anybody else who would, who would attempt to, to perpetrate such a trade would likely be stopped in their tracks and not allowed to proceed or would, would likely uh, be, would, would have faced uh, public, um, uh, you know, scrutiny and, and, uh, and condemnation uh, in short order. But this, this is the whole nature uh, as to why people in the uh, precious metals community or the gold bug community, this, this is why they point to uh, manipulation as being the reason why precious metals are stuck in the rut that they're in. And the, the evidence, in my view, is extremely overwhelming. And, and frankly, anybody literally in one minute, and it was a market order, which means, uh, uh, you know, there was no, there was no uh, restriction given as to the price well, when these things were offered for sale. They were sold at the market, which means bids kept getting hit until the 10,000 uh, contracts were liquidated. So uh, what, this, what this did to the marketplace is it is it dropped the price of silver from uh, just just over sixteen dollars? It dropped it down to fourteen dollars and twenty three cents in 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 the space of a minute. And what happens when that occurs is there are people who leave orders with brokers, for instance, people who are long silver contracts uh, um, who want to. Uh, uh, have have supposedly downside protection to their long position. They leave an order with their broker that if a price threshold is achieved on the downside, uh, their long immediately gets liquidated at the next price. So and 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 this 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 is called uh, people putting in stop loss orders. And what happens when you have a, a flush of, of this many contracts, it triggers and the price drops precipitously in a very short time. These stop loss orders get triggered and it makes people who are long and bullish with silver uh, be forced into a, a liquidation of their position, which, which further, uh, uh, and, you know, uh, yeah. increases the, the downside uh, pressure, um, you know, in, in the underlying contract. So uh, the, the selling of these contracts in su such a short period of time, uh, A, number one, guarantees that the seller is going to